Good evening, welcome. I'm John, I'm the event director at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're pleased to welcome Devarian Al Baldwin, joined in conversation this evening by Nick Tobier. The chat is closed, but you may wanna keep the chat window open uh, during the event as I will be dropping links to purchase in the shadow of the ivory tower from Literati. If you're watching us later on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, there's always links to purchase books uh, in the description right below me. And if you're watching live, of course, you can submit questions for the Q&A portion uh, using the Q&A feature available to you on the webinar at any time. And I'll read a selection of those conversations at the conclusion of tonight's conversation. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup if you live in Southeast Michigan or to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. Uh, in lieu of a book purchase, uh, we would also ask that you consider a $5 donation to sustain our virtual programming, uh, whether you'd like to think of that as this week's or this month's or this year's subscription uh, to our programming, um, you can make a donation at literatibookstore.com slash donation. Otherwise, we simply thank you for your attendance this evening or this morning or this afternoon, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. And uh, now I'll introduce tonight's author and our moderator. Uh, Devarian L. Baldwin is a leading urbanist, historian, and cultural critic. The Paul E. Rather Distinguished Professor of American Studies and founding director of the Smart Cities Lab at Trinity College, Baldwin is the author of Chicago's New Negroes, Modernity, The Great Migration, and Black Urban Life, and co-editor with Minka Makalani of the essay collection Escape from New York, The New Negro Renaissance Beyond Harlem. He has received grants and fellowships from Harvard University, University of Virginia, University of Notre Dame, and the Logan Nonfiction Writing Fellowship from the Cary Institute for the Global Good. He lives with his wife and children in Springfield, Massachusetts. And Nick Tobier is an artist and designer he grew up in the shadowy footprint of two of the institutions portrayed in Devarian's books. He's a co-founder of the Brightmoor Makerspace in Detroit, uh, Libra, a defender for the Penguin soccer team, and a professor at the Stamps School and the University of Michigan and the Center for Entrepreneurship and Edward R. Ginsburg, Senior Counsel to the Provost uh, on Civic Engagement at the University of Michigan as well. They can't hear you, but they can sense you uh, through the powers of the internet. So please join me in welcoming Devarian L. Baldwin and Nick Tobier into your living rooms. Well, wow. thanks so much, John, and thanks, Devarian, so much for your book, um, which I have right here. I have two copies of it. <laughs> um, and then I and I wanted to. Um, this didn't load as much, but this is because we can't hear the applause. Here's my Kermit. Ah, that's here. your Kermit, yeah. <laughs> but that's for you. And um, I wanted that. to start off, and you have, um, for you as a historian, I was really curious how this book evolved for you, both thematically and I'd say sort of conceptually. You know, that's so in many ways reading it, sort of it's uh, thoroughly researched, but it's also filled with anecdote and clear how much time you spent in conversation with people outside the ivory tower. So would, could you describe, you know, when it dawned on you and sort of the methods that sort of followed out of that? Yeah, Nick, thanks so much. So first, let me say thank you to you for um, offering to be in this conversation with me. I appreciate that. And for literary, literary books for um, hosting us in this conversation. And it's wonderful to be all be out there with all of you virtually, if I can't see you, but I'm glad you're here. Um, it's a great question about how the, the history of the history of this book in a way. Uh, I, I was trained, you know, over 20 years ago in American studies, which is primarily an interdisciplinary field um, in New York City. So I was always an urbanist, even when I didn't know it. Um, mm -hmm. I had to leave the city to realize, oh, you, you're an urbanist because we all were urbanists, we couldn't help it. Um, mm -hmm. but, but we learned a certain kind of mixed methodology to not be so academic, but we learned archival work. We learned how to do ethnography. We learned how to do cultural analysis. But when I first came out of graduate school, most of my work, as you saw with the titles of the last of, of my previous books, had been primarily archival, historical. And um, but that training had always been in the background. They're available when it was necessary. And then there was this moment in 2003 when I was actually in the archives at the University of Chicago and I was conducting historical archival work. But then when I came outside of the Rigenstein Library on the South Side, 
history hit me right in the face. Um, and I talk about this in the introduction of the book where you had individuals, there was a, 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 a murmur and, and a protest and shouting. Um, and I followed the sound to the administration building. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a group of Bronzeville, which is the historically black neighborhood to the north of Hyde Park, where the university is on one side and University of Chicago officials on the other. And there was this debate around um, the checkerboard lounge, which is an historic black um, blues um, club tavern um, that was um, the home of these kind of pioneering and iconic events that brought together uh, Muddy Waters and uh, the Rolling Stones and uh, Coco Taylor and just blues great, Chicago being a blues mecca. It was a central uh, landing post touring spot for that. And the University of Chicago was in the process. Well, first of all, the the, town, the, the neighborhood of Brownsville um, and the Checkerboard Lounge essentially had faced some uh, problems with the roof. Hmm. Um, and so local folks in the Brownsville area who had been trying to build a kind of historic tourism around Checkerboard to you know, bring in international and local and national tourists come there. They thought this is an easy fix. But then the next thing they knew, um, the news headlines read that the University of Chicago had come in to save the lounge. And what that meant was picking up the lounge and moving it to the Harper Court Commercial District oh, yeah. um, in the middle of the campus neighborhood of Hyde Park. Yeah. Um, and so the day of the protest, you had individuals from that community, that, that group, um, calling that activity cultural piracy. Huh. Yeah. Um, and so when I, being a researcher, I investigated and said, what's going on? And I found out that this simple act of relocation was just simply the tip of the iceberg of the ways in which the University of Chicago had controlled the South Side, and particularly its Black neighborhoods, for the last century, since its 1892 second founding. And so for me, I followed the, 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 the sources. I, I talked to people. I, I revived those older skill sets of right. doing cultural analysis and interviewing and talk to people. And then they said, oh, well, if you're going to talk about you, Chicago, you got to talk about NYU and Columbia. And if you can talk about that, then, you know, when my friend said, well, you got to come over here and talk about um, uh, the uh, Arizona State University. They're building a downtown campus in the middle of Phoenix. Um, and then it just kind of snowballed from there. Um, and, and, and these stories were kind of anecdotal, but no one had written about them in a collective way. That's super interesting. I, I think, um, you know, just briefly, if I can, not to paraphrase the book, but for those of us, myself included, who work for an edu corporation, the relationship between the university that employs us and the community that surrounds us is sort of a at, at best, a mixed blessing. There are the resources, there's the cultural capital, yes. uh, there's sources of income, but there are also, as you mentioned in the, describing the University of Chicago's relationship to its neighbors, coercive acts in terms of control, whether it has to do with policing as mm -hmm. an extension of planning. you know, the, mm -hmm. And that's what a, I found a lot of the book to be about, which is social control, where universities and municipalities ally themselves in, in a similar aim, which is essentially to uh, sanitize, middle-classicize the rough edges of the city. And so I was wondering, you know, in the intro, you described this incident, which I call, when you and I spoke earlier, I, I described it as swagger jacking. Yeah. The University yeah. of Chicago, sort of like a nerdy institution, mm -hmm. takes some of the cultural legacy of the checkerboard lounge and brings it over right. into its own area. So it can be, we can enjoy the blues, but we don't have to enjoy all of the neighbors that might come with the blues. Right. Would, would you be willing to read a little bit from the intro and sure. from that? Thank you. Thank you for offering the opportunity. And I mean, some of this will be repeat for you all, but um, you might find it enjoyable to, to hear it again. Um, I never thought a university could foretell the future of our cities, but there I was on a December afternoon in 2003, stepping out into the brisk South side air after hours hold away in the University of Chicago Regenstein Library. I immediately heard chants of protest and saw people buzzing about. So I followed the sound over to the main quadrangle just outside the university's administration building. There I saw a crowd of about 50 people surrounded by media crews and onlookers. On one side stood residents from the historic black neighborhood of Brownsville, 
alongside students and others chanting, quote, U of C, look at your history, end quote, while holding signs that read, support the checkerboard lounge in Bronzeville. And on the other side, university officials listened, mostly playing defense with a silent chorus of furrowed brows. The famed checkerboard lounge had been a cultural mainstay of Bronzeville, a blue shrine that had stood on 43rd since 1972. The lounge needed restoring, but instead of providing funding, the university put together a plan to relocate the lounge from its original spot to a university owned building inside the Hyde Park neighborhoods, Harper Court shopping district. Outraged, restoring Bronzeville advocates immediately charged U Chicago with quote, cultural piracy. For decades, the city had turned its back on Bronzeville, but things were slowly changing, largely because of the sweat equity of local advocates working to turn things around. Renovated 100 year old gravestones, newly built condominiums, developments, and at small shops slowly began to fill in the spaces between vacant lots and rundown storefronts. And many saw the checkerboard as central to the economic revitalization of Bronzeville as a quote, heritage tourist destination. But just when momentum started building around a modest neighborhood comeback, the university swept in and bought up one of the area's best cultural assets. And U Chicago's backdoor deal resuscitated almost a century of local stories in which the school had either demolished black neighborhood blocks or built institutional walls to keep black residents away from campus. Here we go again, activist thought. So interesting. I think, you know, the building walls comes up often in the book. So the, um, one of the examples I hope we can get to tonight is talking about the institution that currently employs you and Trinity College and the specifics of the relationship between Hartford and that school as well as Yale and New Haven. But mm -hmm. uh, so I grew up in, in on the Upper West Side in Manhattan, not far from Columbia, right. when there was a lot of, uh, you know, sort of the aftermath of not building a gym in Morningside Heights and yeah. the, sort of the notion of community benefits and university production was something that was sort of swirling around in my house. My dad taught at NYU and it was a time pre John Sexton when right. NYU was kind of a regional local school. And then all of a sudden you get this um, sort of glitzy and you talk about this kind of character several times, this sort yeah. of glitzy figure that describes the importance of the university as what they use as an anchor institution. Right. And I'm curious where in your research and in your examples, where, where you notice that terminology starts happening, where it's so important to be this anchor institution that we need to protect it in a lot of ways, whether it's with walls or gates or policing or with special privileges that allow for favorable tax deals or for instances like cultural piracy. Well, this, this, is, this, this is great because it allows me to talk a little bit about of history, um, about the story that led up to this reality. So just, just for those who are not aware, a major observation after I went to the University of Chicago that became ultimately clear to me was that right before our eyes, colleges and universities have become the largest employers, real estate holders, healthcare providers, and policing agents huh. in major cities and college towns all across the country. So we're not just talking about Ann Arbor and Madison and Gainesville. Um, we're to, or Santa Cruz, we're talking about New York, Chicago, mm -hmm. Atlanta, St. Louis, Cleveland, Los Angeles, Portland, major metropolitan areas where universities had a much more modest role. And so the big question becomes, well, how did we get there? Mm -hmm. So, you know, everyone's familiar with white flight mm -hmm. or what I actually say is actually white people chasing the capital as it moves to the summer. <laughs> They weren't really okay. flying away from anything. They were chasing the money and they were allowed to in right. ways that black and brown people weren't able to follow them to the suburbs. Right. So I'd like to be clear about that. So as that happened and we find significant divestment in central cities, the size and the bureaucracy of universities made it difficult for them to leave. Hmm. So they were one of the few institutions that stayed. And their response in the 50s and 60s, as you talk about so ably, is to build walls, to fortify. And right. in fact, okay. they lobbied to take advantage of uh, urban renewal policy. So they became actually the friendly face of urban renewal. We talk about highways 
and road building <laughs> on demo and, and, and bulldozers. But we don't talk enough about the fact that the Housing Act of 1949 had an amendment 10 years later that offered two dollars for every to a, two dollars for every dollar that was supplied by a city to any development that was tied to a university. And that was created, that was created by uni a university lobbying block of 14 urban uh, universities uh, to be the happy face, the friendly face of urban urban renewal. <laughs> and so right. um, this is real. And so, but, so the fortification became building, demolishing black and brown neighborhoods that surrounded campuses and either um, just keeping them vacant or replacing them with um, uh, campus buildings. And so part of this was eliminating commerce um, and making these areas either purely residential or purely institutional in terms of the university campus buildings. By the time we get to the 1990s, there's this turn back to the city, the back, what was called the back to the city movement. Um, young professionals and empty nesters, the children of suburban sprawl, um, begin to look back at the city with a different interest. They are tired of the monotony of urban environments. Um, but also, let's be clear, the policies of cities made cities back attractive again. So I, I lived in New York in, 90, in the 90s, the era of Rudolph Giuliani, the um, uh, quality of life right. policies that criminalized squeegee um, right. men right. and yeah. being sitting too long in a vestibule, taking up too much space on the subway. Um, this is part of that story whereby trying to clear space, um, turning uh, uh, mental health institutions into high, high, high rise loft living, right? right. And so this was the clearing out process, what um, um, uh, Neil Smith calls revanchism, revenge. Um, this, is that, this is part of that story. And um, so herb, uh, um, young professionals and empty nesters start to turn back to the city. And what they imagine being from a suburban environment for the city is, um, you know, coffee shops, museums, Right. Um, cafes, um, nightlife, density, fully wired neighborhoods. So basically their idea of urbanity mm -hmm. is a campus. Right, that's so interesting. I mean, in some ways, I was talking to some of my students recently who have some strange nostalgia for a time never lived when mm. everybody lived as the friends friends do in New York. Right. right? Where, where right. there's an urbanity that is walkable and coffee Central shop. Perk. <laughs> exactly, that's right. And so we create these campus spaces that resemble sort of Disneyland's of cities mm -hmm. in some ways with heavy policing. Since you mentioned the, that uh, universities were the friendly face of urban renewal, I wanted to um, refer to, I think it was in, when you were talking about the University of Pennsylvania and Ira Harkavy, that yeah. there was the, the um, Netter Center. Yeah. And that um, in some ways there's a sort of sleight of hand where civic engagement might be the friendly face for the university that there's sort of a, a Faustian bargain is that we're doing things in cooperation with community partners at the same time as we're displacing the residents that used to be served by those community partners. Mm -hmm. So is that, a, is that a slightly later face of that? That's, same a, great, that's a great question. So just to continue the story a little bit. So on, on one side, you have this uh, various city leaders competing for the tax base of these various returnees. On the other side, you have shrinking state contributions to mm -hmm. universities. Mm -hmm. So there becomes this moment of interest convergence between university leaders mm -hmm. and municipal politicians. Right. So the university, the uni what I call the university, I saw the capital <laughs> becomes the planning model for the new city to attract investors, researchers, students, empty nesters, young professionals, and their families back into these campus cities. And so about five to 10 years later, the notion, as you mentioned, as you asked about earlier, of the anchor institution comes on board. Right. So you have federal agencies, uh, Henry Cisneros, who was the president, who was the, the director of HUD at the time in the 90s. Um, he sponsors anchor societies. There are grants and money given to universities because the argument here is that, well, if we want to bring back people into the city, um, what is going to, what's going to be the institution that anchors the comeback? That's going to revive, that's going to be there and revitalize these cities. And the idea was universities. Right, right. And so universities latched on to this idea of being anchor institute. We aren't going anywhere. 
Right. And so exactly. people like Henry Henry um, uh, 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 Taylor Jr. and Ira Harkavy right. were old school social justice oriented mm. um, mm. civic engagement figures originally. So Ira Harkavy was actually a student at the moment when UPenn was demolishing black neighborhoods in West Philadelphia to make way for the university, university city science center. So he wow. was a student activist that was doing sit-ins to stop that. But huh. he stayed at UPenn for years and became a professional there. Right. And as time moved forward, he, he um, began to institute and cultivate this idea of enlightened self-interest, that there was a crisis surrounding UPenn and others other, like U Chicago and U, um, uh, 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 USC in South Central LA. And so the only way that we are going to save ourselves to get people to keep coming to the city and coming to these universities is to revitalize the neighborhoods around us. And the way we can make the appeal to university presidents is that if you want to enliven your brand, you have to invest in the neighbors around you. Right. Now, originally they were, these early figures were engaged in civic engagement. Like, you know, this can be a way to help, you know, uh, uh, um, revitalize and offer services to the neighborhoods in which these campuses sit. But what was also going on is that on one side, you had the civic engagement institutions like the Netter Center. And then your good colleague, Harley Etienne, makes his point so well in his book. Yeah, I love that. But yeah. Um, that on the other side, you had the real estate office. Uh, and so yeah, as, yeah. and these two never talked to each other originally. Right. And so while the civic engagement offices are talking about being better neighbors, what that meant to real estate offices is land banking right. blocks and making and, and investing in commercial amenities that students and researchers would like and buying up properties and raising property values so that you can create kind of a student or faculty ghetto or at least raise values that will push out existing residents. Hmm. So the real estate office was taking the language of civic engagement, right. but working almost solely for the university interest. Right. And so I argue in the book that these two lines of, of thought were running in parallel and not intersecting. It's fascinating. Well, I think there's a, there's a language that, that you and I were using in conversation, but it also occurs in the book, this notion of the university as a creator of new knowledge and mm. essentially of public good. Yeah. So therefore anything the university does is for the public good. Right. But how does how um where do, where does that really break in, in which of the examples in the book does that really really break down and say the most illustrative and nefarious way and if so is there a a passage you wanted to read or you want to just talk through mm. yeah yeah let me um let me do that so like the juiciest bit <laughs> okay so so um this idea of the public good becomes most clear um around Princeton University. This is the introduction on page 12. So um, as this critical moment forces us to reckon with higher education's wide ranging influence over our cities, we can't keep discussing colleges and universities in purely educational terms. Universe cities, C-I-T-I-E-S, just to be clear, are all around us, yet we fail to examine the consequences of schools embracing an increasingly for-profit approach to their urban surroundings. Our blind spot to this shift largely comes from the assumption that higher education is an inherent public good, most clearly marked by its tax exempt status for providing services that would otherwise come from the government. But it's here that a critical paradox has emerged. Nonprofit status is precisely what allows for an easier transfer of public dollars into higher education's private developments with little public oversight or scrutiny. City colleges and universities pay virtually no taxes on their increasingly prominent real estate footprint. Even public universities, which are in fact government entities, use their public good status to shelter their own interest in for-profit research or even the financial security of private developers and investors that sit on their campus land. Schools also reap the benefits of police and fire protections, snow and trash removal, road maintenance and other municipal services while shouldering little financial burden. 
homeowners and small business owners take on the weight of inflated property taxes caused by urban campuses while the cost of rental properties skyrocket. Such unfair taxing rates compelled Princeton to pay more than $18 million to settle a 2016 lawsuit with residents of the historically Black New Jersey neighborhood of Witherspoon Jackson. Residents argue that while local property taxes increased, the university still received tax exemption for buildings where research had generated millions of dollars in mm -hmm. commercial royalties. The unqualified belief in higher education's public good creates a lucrative shelter economy where tax exempt status helps generate significant private profits for schools without public discussion and with little public benefit. Donors' gifts to endowments are tax deductible. Right. The investment income earned by endowments is tax free. And higher education institutions have a competitive edge over similar industries, whether biotech or property management, that right. still pay property taxes. One plaintiff in the Princeton case described the university as, quote, a hedge fund that conducts classes. <laughs> that was really chilling. I remember. It. And I, I think that um, in that list that you read, I think of other institutions that also occur that you portray in the book some, somewhat more tangentially than others, but things like Carnegie Mellon, Johns Hopkins, where there's a significant investment in sort of biotech startups that can take cover under the not-for-profit status and not yes. pay taxes. And at the same time, those rising rents displace the types of residents or small businesses that are not a part of the university ecosystem. That's so right. for instance, here on our campus, we had at the Michigan Union, we had sort of local food vendors mm -hmm. for a while. And the university asked them for a significant investment, like $20,000, $25,000 in the facility that they had been renting for years mm -hmm. and they weren't willing or able to pay that. So they were displaced in favor of a Starbucks or a right. Wendy's or things like that. And, you know, it starts to creep through to the point where our sort of main campus area now has where there used to be independent stores, there's Walgreens and CVS and 7-Eleven and Target. And if, you know, as those rents keep creeping up, our students, our faculty and our community start losing a lot of the reasons why, where they found a college town Appealing. To be appealing. And so another example that's perfect, that's a great segue to the, the um, I don't speak about it enough in the book, but um, it's going to come out in later and later discussions, um, is in the, the kind of the rebranded South LA, which is hmm. actually South Central, but we don't say that anymore, right? Wow. Uh, <laughs> and so that's, this, is where, this is where USC uh, is located, um, right? Okay. The gates face out onto South Central Los Angeles. And there, there was a um, U university village shopping uh, court that was a mixture of local businesses at price points that was accessible to the residents that surrounded the campus. Um, the university replaced that with a USC village, which architectural scholars have described as being this architectural train wreck of <laughs> Disney, Disneyland meets Hogwarts um, in this kind of neo-medieval design. Uh, and right. I'm sure we, we've all seen this at different universities on that that style. Right. And so what ultimately happened that the local businesses got pushed out for Trader Joe's, for Starbucks, for these amenities, um, you know, in the name of because students had been had pushed out into the neighborhoods and raising property, raising, raising rent, rent prices um, to, you know, because uh, developers want to meet the needs, landlords want to meet the needs of students who pay more. Right. They put five or six students into a subdivided apartment of two, right. two bedrooms. And so families got pushed out. So the argument behind USC Village was we're going to put some of the housing back on campus to help, um, you know, compensate and under and kind of um, soften the blow of university inflation, university housing inflation. But residents full well understood that the, pr the prices on this USC Village are going to be so inflated. Right. That and, and, and the construction is of such poor quality right. that students are still going to find their way back into the neighborhoods <laughs> um, and reinflate the values of the rental properties. And now on top of that, we don't even have the local businesses and the commercial amenities that we once had with the former university village. Yeah. Yeah. So that's this is a story that we yeah. see. Um, uh, the shops at New Haven. Right. The shops at Yale is another example of that. So local businesses around Yale are being re replaced with Lululemon and Shake Shack. Thank and goodness, right? Everybody everybody of a certain stratus. <laughs> My wife used to teach at Ohio State and there was this area in Columbus between the short north and the campus area that was you know, filled with sort of dive bars and like old, you know, sort of 
old man bars and the university and the city sort of got together and spruced it up mm -hmm. in a way that it starts to look like any mall and it's like you know right. you have the same retail the same restaurants mm -hmm. that's a way i think to attract sort of compete and attract for the same types of students exactly it homogenizes the cities at the same time mm -hmm. and, so, and don't get me wrong i mean local local residents agreed that uh usc village the, the commercial area around yale could have used sprucing up could right. have used some kind of revitalization but that shouldn't have to mean local business displacement it shouldn't right. have to mean commercial homogenization right there right. are a number of options in between those two polarities y yes and, yeah. and we are usually left with either or in these discussions that's true and and towards the end of our time together i want to talk about the work that you do um in the smart cities lab and some of the sort of and I want to let our audience know that we're getting to some of the optimistic bits, but I also yeah. really like that. So here, um, I'm going to ask you to talk about your school a little bit, and I'll sort of preface that by saying that here we are at the University of Michigan that has a complicated relationship, not only with the city that it's in in, in, in Ann Arbor, but also the neighboring city of Ypsilanti, and even more so with Detroit. And as the university contemplates or acts in sort of large development um, projects in Detroit that are um, sort of a counter narrative to what we present in terms of civic engagement with the real estate office and the civic engagement don't speak the same language. Uh -huh. um, there, our hands are not clean in any way in this. So I, I'm really curious if you could, if you're willing to talk about what it was like for you to write about the school at which you teach and to give yeah. a little bit of the arc of some of the characters involved. And sure. then if, if there's a passage you want to read or at least describe your experience in uh, yeah being uh, um, really pointedly critical, but also shining a light on, on sort of the legacy of New ha of uh, Hartford's relationship to yeah. Trinity College. Sure, thank you. Um, so, you know, full disclosure, I'm a professor at Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut, and there is a chapter in this book about Trinity's relationship to Hartford. Um, Trinity College was founded in 1823 as one of the um, elite liberal arts uh, colleges like Williams or Amherst are part of the, the what's called the Little Ivies. Right. Yeah. Um, but on the other side, people say it's just, it's one of those schools that, that people go to when they can't get into Yale. Uh, <laughs> so it has both of those dynamics. Um, and it's in the middle of, of what has become an increasingly poor, brown, primarily Latinx um, city, capital city. And um, for decades, the university found different ways to fortify itself and the stories that we've been telling all along. Um, in fact, the, the, the Gothic quadrangle style of the University of Chicago that we're all familiar with, that was modeled on Trinity's campus. Huh. It's, oh, it was actually okay. the design model for the oh. campus of the University of Chicago, which is what more well known, but that the, the wall fortification, the medieval design that comes from Trinity College in the middle of a city. Um, and so when we get to the 1990s, there is that same kind of story about the UPenn of interest of, of, of enlightened self-interest that um, for years, the elite nature of Trinity College was able to rise above its existence in a modest capital city. But the violence and the poverty got to certain points that people were not coming to the school in the night in the 80s and 90s because of fears of, you know, sometimes it wasn't even fears of violence, it was just fears of poverty. Right, right. Um, poverty looked different. And so, um, Trinity did something that they, they even its own trustees and alums thought they would never do and didn't necessarily want to do. They, had, they hired this, um, uh, this interesting character by the name of Evan Dobell, who didn't right. get his bachelor's degree until, until he was 30, in his 30s wow. and had, had only been the university president of a community college, of a two-year college. He had been a Republican uh, mayor, and then he also worked under Democrat Jimmy Carter. So this really interesting kind of character, uh, a force of nature. And he came to Trinity in the 1990s with the full intent saying, I'm not here to get tenure, to I, I have no investments in the, in the trappings of university promotion and ascendancy and status. I'm here to save the college. Mm -hmm. And so what he did was he instituted this thing called the Learning Corridor, which was supposed to be this menu of commerce and um, uh, middle schools and high schools and housing. And he said that what he wanted to do was engage in um, a geographic affirmative action. He said he believed that you don't have to build a campus community where the people that currently live there have to leave or it has to be filled with university types 
that you can build a campus community where the people that live there currently can stay. And so he, he, he you know, he got some money from, um, from Sally Mae mm-hmm. and from HUD, and he attempted to build out this learning corridor and what he called University Heights. Now, old type blue bud, you know, Trinity College old, old types were aghast at this and were always suspicious of this. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, Evan Dobell was a big talker. He was a showman. He liked the flash. He liked the buildings and didn't always focus on the detail. So when the money ran out, um, people, other people were left holding the bag on what to do. Right. They were actual construct constructions stopped in midair, you know, mm. you know, and or in mid in mid development. I'll say that. Um, and so those who were always reticent about this kind of work, they call this work social work. You know, this is not what liberal arts colleges do. And so some of the professors I spoke to that were of color and that come that came there in the 90s, they were always a, 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 amazed and aghast, you know, um, about, you know, what do you mean by liberal arts? You know, and um, and he and and they found out quickly that liberal arts mean you know enclosure, elevated. Right, that's right. Education right. separate from the world. Right, refuge. Right, hermetic, right? like a monastic tradition. That's right, and at the, yeah. and they they really embrace the idea of the campus in Latin meaning field. Oh, right, I, this yeah. refuge in the middle of urban environs or away from urban environs. Right, and so. When he ran, when he talked to Big Talk and ran out of money, um, that that liberal arts approach washed in very quickly, and there was a return to ambivalence. It's always been this ambivalence, you know. Um, what I say in the in the book, you know, either um, you know uh, reticent outreach or knee jerk enclosure, mm-hmm. and because. Trinity College had a relatively small endowment compared to Yale or even compared to Amherst. Um, They couldn't demolish whole blocks. So their approach was using community engagement as a way to push forward the universe, the college interest. And so for example, in the current moment, um, this has meant like building a downtown campus. Wow. Yeah. And I can read a little bit from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I remember re- I, that, that's really interesting. I think it m- makes me think a little bit of Syracuse, mm-hmm. some of the similar models. Right. So, um, hmm. Trinity's camp push for a downtown campus endured many fits and starts. Reminiscent of the Dobell years, Evan Dobell from previous times, announcements of a new urban campus made a big splash, but at first few people were clear about what was actually going on. In 2014, an alum brought an investment deal to the college. He recommended that Trinity buy the building at 200 Constitution Plaza on auction for the steal of $2 million. Suddenly a school strapped for cash got the deal done. Trinity became a downtown landlord in a complex many deemed a horrible remnant of urban renewal development from the 1960s. The entire plaza is elevated above street level with little parking and is also difficult to access by public transportation. Moreover, the downtown campus is in the central business district, nowhere near the communities that could most benefit from partnerships with Trinity. The financial team thought the college could use the first floor and lease the rest. When the property failed to attract tenants, Trinity sold the building to a New York City real estate group for a small profit. Then the college turned around and spent more money leasing two spaces on the plaza at one and 10 Constitution Plaza. What was really going on? When I talked to the president, she admitted their strategy wasn't fully developed, but it was important for Trinity to make a big statement. Berger Sweeney pointed out that for decades, Trinity was the only residential college in the city, but that now it had been left behind. When the college finally looked back toward Hartford, other schools had surpassed Trinity as engines of urban revitalization. St. Joseph and the University of Connecticut both stretched beyond their suburban outposts to stake a claim in the city. The former opened up a pharmacy school downtown in 2010 
And in 2017, UConn unveiled a full campus where students move from renovated historic buildings to shared space in the Hartford Public Library oh. and the 170 year old Wadsworth Athenaeum Museum of oh. Art. Um, Espinoza, uh, 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 a staff member at, at, the, at, at, at Trinity who also grew up in the neighborhood, right, described him. the hasty Constitution Plaza purchase as a higher education rush to the Arctic when Trinity followed behind other schools planting their flag in downtown Hartford. And just to move forward um, a minute, I just want to um, um, go forward. Espinoza explained that under Jones, the one division, no, I'm sorry, not there. Um, another member of the downtown campus design committee who asked to remain anonymous was even more candid. This person said that when Trinity turned back to the city, administrators never even thought to secure a foothold in the neighborhoods where the community organizations existed. Mm -hmm. They pointed right. out right. that um, Iraqi, a faculty member, and others had proposed renovating a historic theater right on Broad and Park in the Latinx neighborhood near the college, but that was never going to happen. Trinity had always focused on the central business district to secure internships and also to gain a foothold in the lucrative graduate certificate market used oh by adult professionals. The school was losing adult students in Hartford to programs as far away as Brown University and its executive leadership curriculum in Providence. And as the pool of college ready students able to pay $70,000 rapidly shrank, the Action Lab partnership with the community college also tapped into a new pool of low-income students carrying federal aid that could be shuttled into Trinity programs. This administrator said the money was always the priority, whether through leasing property, securing a new student pool, or bolstering the school brand, brand around career development. The Liberal Arts Action Lab is polite cover, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Everyone I spoke to agreed that the work of the lab is exciting, this is in the downtown campus, no matter how it got started. But the bigger concern rests with the broader shift in the meaning of urban engagement under President Berger Sweeney. They wonder whether Trinity's revived outreach into Hartford is about equitable community partnerships or primarily a brand management strategy for financial gain. So in this story, um, being in the central business district and securing internships in the, fin in the, in the financial sector, just simply having Trinity downtown was billed as community engagement. Yes. And so many observers said, is this simply a bait and switch where simply being downtown, engaging in financial transactions that would benefit the college can serve as a catch-all for actually being community engaged or urban, urban engagement? Yeah. We are, we are facing such a similar question here and and there's nothing it's like a train that's already left i want to make sure we get the questions but just and you you may be aware of it u of m is at some point soon going to break ground on this innovation center in detroit which has these executive um sort of micro masters and you know all sorts of things yep certificates and micro security. laboratories and startup incubators and that's right and in the and in the downtown core um yeah. but and, and in a very problematic site. So I know in one of the chapters we're not gonna to get to about Arizona State. Arizona State, yeah. Talk about Phoenix as, as mm -hmm. a blank canvas. And so there's yeah. a lot of, but I wanted to um, also watching John, there's some yeah. questions in the Q and A. John, I forgot, you can hear me, but I forgot how it works. Do you read the questions or do I read the questions? I think if you'd like to read the questions, please, please feel free to. Well, as you prepare that, let me just say really quickly, these yeah. innovation districts, or there's a, there's actually a company called Wexford Corporation Developers. They specialize in these, what they call knowledge communities, which are these, for, as, a, as, a, as a designer and planner and urbanist, you will appreciate this, these sites that are usually tax exempt because they have the educational purposes uh, cover are these conglomerations of research laboratories, of real estate, of housing, mm -hmm. Of, of, of classrooms that become the sites of value capture, 
where there's this murky idea of what's going on here. Is it for educational purposes? Is it for profit interest? Is it creating royal, is it creating research and development for for-profit royalties that will come back to the campus? Yeah. Wow. And so this is popping up all over the country, these innovation districts and yeah. these knowledge yeah. communities. And yeah. so that's that's a very important new planning model that's yeah. extending out into these cities. And the cities pay because when they remain tax exempt, right. the property taxes that would normally go to public schools, right. to and road management, or to the Texas, yeah. the electric yeah. grid, right. they, that money is now not going to those infrastructural needs. Yes. Yeah. So I just wanted to add that. No, thank you. Well, yes, yeah, if my blood wasn't sort of excited enough, thank you. <laughs> so I, I read um, some of the questions and start there and, and, sure. uh, and however long you can spend with us is terrific. So first question is, what's the effect of commercial homogenization on quality of education? Mm. So this is interesting. There's been quite a bit written about the university as corporation. And so when this means is that, for example, like the Koch brothers, or other private investors. This happened to my good colleague, Garrett Felber uh, in, at the University of Mississippi. Um, when he started critiquing the degree that in which um, don donors were shaping the curriculum of campuses. Um, so we, you know, moving towards STEM, undermining humanities and social sciences, um, organizing the curriculum around purely career development. This is what homogenization looks like for education. That's fascinating. And so when, when, when Garrett Felber, critique this and he didn't have tenure, um, he was summarily removed from campus. Wow, wow. And so just to answer the question directly to the questioner, uh, to the question person, this is what happens to homogenization. We get a, um, and we, the market is, is, is trendy, it, it's fickle, it shifts. So as we chase market trends in our curriculum, um, we're already steps behind right. and we're right. chasing, you know, skill sets to make people, and I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare students for, for careers, but when whole curriculums get organized around market impulses, right. Right. Um, it's fickle and there's no substance and this is what we have. So now we're moving all online, trying to monetize that experience. That's another homogenization process. Students are struggling mm -hmm. from a psychological, from a traumatic, from an interpersonal level. Um, people are saying this can cut costs. Um, this, we can, we can homogenize, homogenize the educational experience and students are not one size fits all and they're struggling right now. That's right. And yeah. so this is what's happening with, with the um, online education, with the moving towards career development, with the moving from purely STEM, with on the faculty side, um, the work that we do as being or governed by these metrics, you know, um, where's your work placed? Is it, you know, outward facing? You can't do quote unquote pure research. Your research has to have market applications. Can it be brought to market? And those individuals gaining more um, a status right. um, and prestige on the campus if their work is market ready. And so this is what's happening to higher education. Um, but I say that there's been great work done on this the conversation about universities as corporations, but very little work has stepped outside the gates to look at what I'm calling the knowledge economy, mm -hmm. this point at which academic research is being used to produce products and patents in a range of fields from pharmaceuticals and software to military uh, weaponry. Um, that's one part of it. But in order to attract these researchers and their families, turning, um, turning parts of the city into amenities rich playgrounds to compete for these researchers and their families so that yeah. your prestige and your royalty portfolio can increase. And that's the part that we're talking about, the ways in which the police forces of these campuses are the front line of displacement, gentrification, population management, social control, to set the table to make these spaces safe for these knowledge communities, for these families, for these students. Right. And this is the larger story that we're not talking about. We're talking right. about student debt. We're talking about university as corporation. We're not talking about city as campus. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, in a lot of ways, you'd think that if you're interested in an urban school, you're interested in it as a complex scenario, not right. as a sanitized version that happens to have the city as a backdrop where you still have the gap and Shake Shack and everything That's alongside right. that. We, we, we used to believe, and I'm not, and I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to romanticize this because this is definitely not the case 
um, for people of color and for women for a long time, but ideally believe that you go to a university to experience difference. Right, yeah. Now the new planning design and the new financial arrangements is that I want to go to a university that's just like home. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, it's interesting what that does spatially and psychologically to the mind that says, I'm already comfortable here, right. therefore I don't have to do any sort of right. cultural adjustment. I don't have to step outside of my comfort zone. I don't have to challenge myself. I don't have to think about what my identity is going to be and this is a new experience. I just yeah. want to be here to be confirmed. Fascinating. The point here is that there's a, there's a direct linkage between the material build out of these campuses and the psychological training that's going on in these classrooms Incredible. and in these environments. Yeah. Um, all right, the next question, so that's, that's amazing. And um, there's a Joe's Pizza This is that opened in Ann Arbor. There's a branch of the Joe's in yeah. the West Village. And one of the things that, it's great pizza. We had really bad pizza in the Midwest, but one of the things that it does is it makes the students and myself from the East Coast feel more comfortable because yeah. it reminds us of, and I think there's something, there's no way I can defend Midwest pizza as useful for the educational but, but I'm, I'm from Chicago so I like deep dish but I <laughs> we have that too come visit All right, so the next question is do huge sports programs provide an additional smoke screen for local displacement and colleges tax-free status and this is because Michigan's in the elite eight right now that's tonight right. Like tonight but that's right so this works in a number of ways so um stadium building becomes a new route of fortification right. the money for stadiums usually comes from the public till and then the stadium produces profits um, um, through ticket sales, but also in the big in the Big Ten, we obviously you get good, lucrative uh, TV contracts and rights, and um, those stadiums are usually tax exempt. And on top of that, we talk we talk about graduate student labor that um, is is um, suppressed. The wages are suppressed under the guise of apprenticeships, right? Being students and not workers. And shout out right now to Columbia University and Brown and NYU who are either on strike or about to strike wow. to be identified as workers. The same phenomena is happening right now on the sports field. So if you're watching the big dance, you have a couple of African-American, primarily basketball players that have t-shirts saying, hashtag not NCAA property. So uh, we these universities read millions off of TV contracts and paraphernalia rights and the likenesses of these players. And under the guy, again, educational purposes, under the guise of being a student athlete, right. these students receive nothing. Wow, yeah. And so this becomes another yeah. mo mode of using the category of educational purposes, whether it be prop tax exemption or it be um, the apprenticeship status of student workers in the laboratories or as, or as, as TAs or as athlete workers as being student athletes, amateur status, amateurism. All of these become mechanisms of wealth extraction. They're, 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 they're not anecdotal. They're a part of a more comprehensive business model. And yeah. we need to understand that. And yeah. I say, if we can talk about solutions for a minute, I say that one of the solutions should be that the neighborhoods and communities that produce these students should receive a portion of the wealth that they create. That's really interesting. That, that brings me to one of my questions I had about the work you do with the Smart Cities Lab. So you have a, a number of points that come up in the end of the book about community benefits agreements. Yes. Do these, do these things exist in practice or are these sort of utopian visions? That... <laughs> they do. So um, when Columbia expanded into West Harlem because of, because of community and student activism, they were forced to um, put together a community benefits agreement which offered um, construction jobs, job training, um, but it didn't go far enough. It, even insiders at Columbia say that the community benefits agreement there should have been based on the total, it was a fixed rate, it was a fixed amount of money. It should have been based on the total value of the campus development. Um, when USC built um, uh, uh, USC Village, um, local politicians, city council members forced them to sign on to a community benefits agreement in order to get the right to, to rezone the area. Hmm. And what came with that was zip code specific. This is important because sometimes they'll offer job training or jobs, but it will be regionally. So what will happen is you'll have um, white suburbanites coming in, getting the jobs and the right. local residents in the neighborhood don't receive the jobs. So it had zip code specific job training and, and uh, 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 construction jobs. They built a firehouse in the neighborhood. Um, so so there, there, there was that. Um, one thing, though, is that Henry Taylor 
Jr., who we talked who I talk about in the, in the kind of anchor institutions in the 90s, he was coming out of kind of a black Marxist um, urban planning training. And so when they brought him to University of Buffalo to put together a plan for their neighborhood, he talked about, and this is before we talk about this now, he talked about the university, turning the university into a commons. Hmm. And it should be opened up right. to the, the, it's, that everyone in the neighborhood should be a member of the camp, that all facilities should be utilized by the community. Everyone, every member of the community should have a, a, a membership card to use all the facilities on campus. Um, that was quickly shut down. <laughs> yeah. So the point being yeah. is that these models have existed historically and they exist now. In my epilogue, I talk about the University of Winnipeg. I love that one. Yeah, would you, t- would you just... Re- so really quickly, I know we're probably done, but yeah. real quickly, um, um, Lloyd Axworthy was the president of the university um, in the 90s. And he had this vision of sustainability that included environmental, economic, political, and cultural. And so he understood that at that time, the demographic of the campus was changing. It was primarily going from being commuter, commuter suburban whites to urban indigenous and uh, new Canadians, what we call immigrants, new Canadian oh, Canadians yeah. that had different needs. They came with families and they were working class or working poor. And so instead of hiring an outside developer, they created a local, they created their own development corporation to build housing that was mixed at market, at rent geared to income, affordable market and premium. And the premium units paid for everything else so that not only anyone that was going to school, and this, this doesn't mean at the University of Winnipeg, you could be doing a correspondence class, you could be doing a mechanics class. If you were going to school, you could gain access to this housing. You'd be a resident of the neighborhood, of the community. So mixed housing. Um, they fired, the University of, Wisconsin, of Winnipeg fired um, Aramark, one of the ma- major multinational food service corporates, you know, Aramark, Marriott, like, Sedesco, yeah. you know, all those companies. They fired them and created their own diversity foods company. Wow. That yeah. profit shares with the workers, 65% of the workers are from marginalized communities being um, uh, recently incarcerated, single mothers, new Canadians. Um, they, um, they resource their raw materials for the food with, from within a hundred kilometer radius, 65% of that material. They have compost stations next to their food with their work, their workstations, their cooking oil is shipped out to be converted to biodiesel. So this is a different approach. So when people say, well, you're being so critical, what's the alternative? There are a number of alternatives. There are, yeah. Yeah, you know, these are possible. With, even within the campus model, there are a number of alternatives for doing things differently. Their recreational facility has a community charter. Community organizations have a guaranteed number of hours to use the University of Winnipeg recreational facility, a, number, a guaranteed number of hours every week. Yeah. To use right. so, so alternatives are possible. But even in Winnipeg, there are some and some of their faculty said the downtown campus model is still not enough. They aren't directly in the indigenous communities in the North End. So so Jim Silver left the downtown campus and built his own branch mm-hmm. in the North, in the indigenous North End. So the stories are endless. So I'm just saying, if you want to know more and I'm not trying to just plug, mm-hmm. go to Literati, pick up the book. Check it out. Hit me on Twitter at Devarian Baldwin. Let's have a conversation. I've been hit with critiques for on the book already saying, well, e- they, they, they've offered the either or. Either we can have the university as it is, or what right. do we do? Just get rid of universities all, you know, this either or model. So we just get rid of universities altogether. Right. And my response is that no, there is so much room in the middle. There's so right. many things that could be done in between either keeping universities as they are or getting rid of universities altogether. There's so much that can be done and to create the anti-racist university, the social justice university, the, the end of the profit university and the revival of the people's university. That right. is within our grasp. We have students and community members in the streets right now saying cops off campus. Right. that are saying, um, um, spend some of your endowment in the communities in which you sit. They are saying, your healthcare facility should be, you receive tax exemption for these mega health facilities and you're not, and your tax exemption is predicated on indigent care. You're not doing enough. So the job of this book has landed in the middle of a mental and political transformation. 
but these campaigns have been individual. And the, the service that I hope my book offers is to say that these individual campaigns for reconstruction need to be placed within a larger vision mm-hmm. of this university model. Yeah. That we need to coordinate, converge, and engage it from a comprehensive standpoint. That's so, so amazing. There, there's, there's another question that came in. I don't know if, John, if we have time or um, Devarian, if, if you have yeah, time. Yeah, I'm good. If, if, okay. if you have time, I have time. All right. So that, that was really a beautiful conclusion. So this sort of pivots back to talking about Penn a little bit. So the question okay. is, does the book discuss Penn, UPenn's project of building a new public school in West Philly, a lab project school for the, with the School of Ed that yeah. served as a community amenity? And how did that turn out? Do you yeah. know that example? I know an example. Yeah. And, and I don't speak about it in detail because my good colleague, Harley Etienne, talks about it in detail in his book. So I'm saying, I'm going to tell you part of the story, but go get his book if you want to know more about that story. So um, this divide between uh, uh, civic engagement and the real estate office also played its way out in those amenities. Those amenities were promised to the community as community services, but the catchment area for that school, meaning the district, the radius in West Philadelphia that would be oriented towards those who would be eligible for that school, Penn, uh, 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 the Penn School, was oriented towards the area where more faculty were resettling than it was oriented towards the areas where they were existing residents. So this is how these things right. have played yeah. out, that right. these amenities have been geared towards the researchers, the students and their families and away from the existing community. Amenities in name, but the question becomes for whom? Uh-huh. A lot of universities talk about their economic impact and I wouldn't deny that. They produce jobs, they bring in businesses and investors, but the question remains, do these amenities and the value and the wealth, do they ever trickle down in ways that allow the existing residents to be able to profit and stay? Or do they become a gateway for displacement and evasion? Yeah. So yeah. I, that's that's what I want to say that's about the beauty. That. John, I see you here. Does that yeah. mean we have to go? Yeah. Yes, I think yeah. that's a beautiful okay. note to end it on as well. And um, Tavarian Baldwin, thank you so much for joining us this thank evening you. At, at Home with Literati. Nick Tobier, thank you so much as well. Uh, your slander of Detroit style pizza, notwithstanding. Oh yeah, you know, I've never um, actually had it. No, it wasn't Detroit style. It's like the sort of Midwest ubiquity, cottage in fine. I'm, oh yeah, I'm with you there with like yeah. St. Louis style pizza, which is an affront to mankind, but. I'm a Chicago, I love, I love Chicago deep dish. You know, I'm gonna put that out there, being from the Midwest. So it's, I'm from it's, Wisconsin. On the board, on the Illinois Wisconsin border, so I I, I ride from my Chicago style deep dish. So <laughs> when you're both, when we're when when you when you come back for the next book, you come through Ann Arbor. Perhaps you and Nick and I should go to Original Buddies and yeah, yeah, it. that's I've never tried it. And so let's yeah. okay, I'm yeah. with it. Right. I'll be happy. Um, but right. thank you so so much for joining Thanks us, so and much. and we hope you continue to stay safe and be well. And to all of our viewers, thank you so much um, for joining us as well. And uh, we hope you continue to sit, stay safe and be well. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. But until then, uh, have a great night and take care. Good Thank night you. All. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Bye, Thank you. Bye. Thanks so much. So much. That was great. <laughs>